Hello, welcome to another session of Digital Slide Review and Sign Out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, coming to you from the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. And our program is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, which is a joint effort of PATH Presenter and the Digital Pathology Association, where I chair the Education Committee. Uh, our case today comes from the realm of uh, gynecologic uh, pathology, um, and it's quite an interesting case um, in uh, a number of ways. So the patient is a, a 40, excuse me, a 70 year old woman, I got the age wrong there, uh, and she's had some abnormal bleeding, some postmenopausal bleeding, which uh, naturally in a postmenopausal woman leads to an endometrial biopsy. Uh, now, why do we do this? Well, uh, of course, uh, what we know is that uh, one of the uh, signal signs of uh, endometrial cancer is uh, vaginal bleeding. But of course, there are many benign causes for vaginal bleeding. And I thought it'd be interesting to just review this age breakdown in terms of endometrial hyperplasia, not atypical, uh, and atypical hyperplasia as opposed to endometrial cancer, which tends to peak a little bit later. But notice that uh, here, even in the uh, 30s and 40s, we have a uh, non-insignificant uh, rate at which uh, we can detect cancer in uh, these patients, even though that'll be far, far less than uh, the uh, cases where we have atypical hyperplasia or um, benign hyperplasias. Um, and just to compare here, notice that the peak for a typical hyperplasia here is about 50, whereas the peak for endometrial cancers is uh, uh, you know, maybe five, 10 years later before that uh, age peak uh, appears to hit. So um, with that in our uh, mindset, let's take a look at this sample um, and the digital slide here. Uh, which, uh, as we can see at low magnification, includes a number of fragments of myometrium, um, some fragments where we've got big dilated glands, such as here and here, uh, and then this fragment that looks quite different from either of those uh, prior two uh, issues. So we'll take a look up here because that's kind of where uh, there's a fair bit of this action. So uh, benign myometrium, sort of uh, cystic changes, sort of the thing you'd see with either cystic atrophy or maybe an endometrial polyp. Uh, and then this process, which we see has a lot of associated mucin and uh, some papillary structures, very thin wall or thin uh, papillae here. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of mucinous differentiation. In addition, we have a number of kind of free-floating papillae in this. So there's some complexity to this uh, that is uh, not trivial. Uh, looking a little more closely, uh, we can see uh, that uh, these cells show uh, mucoid cytoplasm in some instances, and then some intervening cells, which are more eosinophilic and may have a little tufted uh, surfaces and so forth, the more um, almost apocrine appearing in some respects but certainly more bland columnar cells with just interspersed uh, mucinous uh, changes. So um, the other feature to uh, note here is that uh, there's really no significant crowding. Uh, you, know, you can see, you can draw a line between every nucleus here fairly easily. There's no hyperchromasia. These nuclei are uh, fairly bland looking and they're rounded to oval shape. Now, if we compare those nuclei with uh, those which we have elsewhere in the sample, say in our endometrial polyp, um, we may be able to find some uh, significant differences there. So here's a, a bit of that uh, tissue. Oops. And here we can see um, that, uh, in fact, here in this polyp, we've got a little bit of some of the same kind of metaplasia going on, a little bit of... Uh, columnar cells here, but are, these are not cytologically particularly different uh, from uh, those other epithelial cells that we have in the papillary proliferation uh, here, as you can see. Some are a little more columnar, some a little more cuboidal, um, but uh, no significant atypia again. Well, there's another slide that came with this uh, case as well, and I just uh, 
take a quick look at that uh, as well to get a, a balance of the, the findings here. Again, we see some fragments of myometrium, these uh, more polypoid fragments with cystic glandular change, um, and then a few of these fragments with uh, little uh, foci of uh, papillarity, as you can see here. Now, we also have here a sort of uh, hyalinized uh, fibrinoid area that could be either uh, an old placental site nodule or uh, some other elastotic vessel or something of that sort uh, as well, but not something to be concerned about. Uh, and here again, we see this abundant mucinous uh, epithelium, um, very bland appearing cytology, and this prominent papillarity. So uh, what is this? Well, it looks to be fairly benign, but the complexity here with this degree of papillarity is a little bit concerning. Uh, and so what do we call this? Uh, what sort of a term would be appropriate for this? Well, um, the term that uh, I would use uh, and that others have used to describe this type of change is an endometrial papillary proliferation. Um, and these can be both very simple and more complex. But when we think of complex here, we're really thinking architectural complexity. Um, in uh, the larger series of these, uh, there was found that metaplasia is very common, and that can be of several types, both a ciliated type, mucinous, or even eosinophilic metaplasia. And a fair number of the cases that have been described have been associated with polypoid changes. Now, the concern comes is that in some of those more complex versions, there is some associated underlying either endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia or potentially carcinoma. Uh, in other words, sometimes these are seen overlying those kinds of, in, of lesions. And so in something that is sampled only by curatage, uh, you may be concerned that there is the potential, albeit perhaps small, that there's something uh, that may be more serious waiting behind. Now, usually these are postmenopausal patients, but uh, even patients as young as 23 uh, have been reported with these uh, abnormalities. Now, the important thing to realize here is that a very bland cytology, such as we see in our lesion, is the normal finding. And it does not differentiate those that have associated EIN or carcinoma from those that do not. And so, uh, there's this very uh, potent, great potential to be sort of lulled into the benign, don't worry about this category because it looks cytolog cytologically so um, indifferent. Uh, but in fact, uh, that is not a reliable marker, at least according to the published studies. And it's really the architectural complexity that should guide uh, and govern your classification. Uh, so in our case, uh, we would think that there's more complexity there. Now, a very nice study that appeared from uh, Dr. Ip and colleagues at Mass General and elsewhere um, that described these uh, cytologically and uh, from a large series of patients, over uh, 50 patients. Uh, and you can see how these stand out. Here's an area in this polypoid structure. Here's another area. And then there's areas of more benign polyp. Uh, here's an area where uh, you actually have more complexity and so forth. It begins to look almost like carcinoma, but yet uh, here at higher magnification, you see there's very little atypia. Uh, and so uh, calling this a complex uh, hyperplastic lesion is uh, appropriate. Uh, here we see again these uh, complex lesions with a metaplastic sort of uh, eosinophilic metaplasia uh, in these uh, cases. Um, another case, uh, examples here, uh, more mucinous type of appearance. Uh, and as you can see, it can be fairly focal uh, in some areas um, and uh, here on the surface, but overlying a more serious lesion here down deeper in the endometrium. Uh, so uh, that gives you a little bit of a flavor. Well, what are the considerations differentially? Well, I thought that uh, the Dr. Ip and his colleagues also did a great job with this, so I borrowed their slide. So here's something that looks just like what we had, uh, maybe not quite as mucinous, um, but you wanna think about uh, the possibility that you're dealing with a villoglandular type of cancer. Uh, so in this case, you do have more cytologic atypia, 
nuclear enlargement, nucleoli, variability of nuclei, some crowding. That could look very similar to what we had, uh, but with that cytologic atypia, you would be concerned about that. Um, endometrial carcinoma with the small non-villous papillae, that also can be seen. Usually these are low-grade uh, lesions and have this micropapillary type of appearance uh, in some of the glands. Uh, so that's an, also a consideration. Um, uh, sort of uh, surface uh, papillary syncytial change uh, can be seen either with breakdown or over an infarcted polyp, uh, those sorts of changes. Uh, and finally, just sort of the pseudopapillary appearance of, of glands that are, you know, kind of get collapsed in on themselves uh, could be mistaken. But usually this is, there's an overall appearance of a benign lesion, maybe even a hormonally uh, responsive lesion. And so that's not such a, a huge problem. But those are three things to consider, villoglandular carcinoma, endometrial carcinoma with micropapillary projections, uh, papillary surface syncytial changes, uh, and uh, coiled uh, endometrial glands with pseudopapillae. Well, thank you very much. Our final sign-out diagnosis is complex endometrial papillary proliferation or hyperplasia. Um, and we would append to this, because it's an unusual entity, a note indicating the prognosis um, and potential for underlying lesions and therefore warranting uh, further evaluation or follow-up. Uh, so as not to uh, miss those sorts of things uh, prospectively. Well, thanks so much for joining me. I appreciate your attention. And if you like this, well, you know the drill. Hit that subscribe button, hit the like button. Uh, that will help uh, it reach uh, more of our audience. And uh, you'll be uh, a part of our valuable team in helping to spread this uh, valuable pathology education to those who are looking for these kinds of things. So I appreciate you spending some time with me. And uh, until next time. Thanks so much for joining me.